going to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter number 5, verse 36 to 39, and I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet for the reading of God's Word. Luke, chapter 5, verse 36 to 39, and here we will have Jesus responding to the antagonism of the Pharisees uh, in the way that only Jesus can do. Amen. Can you say amen again? When you have it, say amen. If you look and say, wait a minute. Amen, amen, okay. Well, we'll put it on the screen if you can't find it. Some of y'all got hip to that. You don't even look no more. Amen. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent or tears, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. Glory to God, your clothes got to be in agreement. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottle and be spilled and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. Can you say amen? amen? Oh, glory to God. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith the old is better. I want to use a subject tonight, torn between the two. Torn between the two. Holy Spirit, help me tonight. I'm yours. All of me is yours. Use me however you choose tonight. I'm grateful for the grace to stand here tonight in the house of the Lord to feed the people of God. I thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. You may be seated. Old traditions die hard. They don't go easily. They don't go intellectually. It is possible to know that something is okay and find it difficult to do it because it is so ingrained in you to think a certain way that even faced with truth, you find it difficult to walk in truth because tradition has so ensnared you that you find it difficult to be free. I, the other day, we were at the, the woman, our, by the way, we had a, a <laughs> child. <laughs> I don't even know what to call that we had up there. That, that woman, our loose, will go down in the books. It was just absolutely amazing. Uh, well, they were having girl talk and they were doing a business session and I had come in and I had a hat on and there was nothing in the world wrong with wearing a hat except if you came out of my generation, it's hard to do. So I just did it out of defiance. I wore the hat in there just to let the devil know that I know that there is no scripture in the Bible prohibiting me wearing a hat in church. I wore it up till service and then I kind of, I kind of took it off, you know, I kind of took it off. I'm just little by little baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. Two things I have trouble wearing in church for no reason other than old school tradition is hats and sunglasses. I think I have trouble wearing sunglasses because I think I look cool in them. And if I think I would look cool, you know, the old folks say, you're not supposed to be looking cool in your, I don't know. I, I can't explain it. I don't believe it. I don't think that way. There is no scripture that I know of about sunglasses in the Bible. In fact, I don't even think they had sunglasses in Bible days. But it, it, regardless to the fact that there is no scripture, tradition roots down in you and it does not come away easily. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees who are bound by tradition 
and he speaks to them in a profound way that says if you mix something new with something old, whether it is fabric, new fabric mixed with old fabric will cause one to tear because one of the fabrics has relaxed because of its age, and the other one is new and has not been pulled yet. When it pulls, it will pull them apart because they are not in agreement. I cannot tell you how many people are pulled apart, torn between two, torn between two loves. Yeah, that's right. Say Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, torn between two loves. Yeah, y'all got real quiet. I must have struck a nerve. Maybe I should stay there a little while longer. You, 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 your, your heart is split. Your thoughts are divided. Your emotions are torn apart and you're wrestling inside of yourself. And, and don't act like you have never been in this situation where you have said, I love you to two different people and thought you meant it. Where are the real saints said, I need, I need some real saints. Torn between two lives. Torn between two lives. Trying to be faithful to who you used to be while you are aspiring to be who you're going to be and you find yourself torn between two lives, not wanting to disappoint the people you came from, who knew you when, and at the same time wanting to embrace the people who know you now. And either way you turn, you are made to feel guilty because the people who knew you back then say, oh child, I knew you when. And, you, and then you go back and try to act normal, you know, and because like you used to act, I won't say normal, but like you used to act because they say you acted all new. And they make you feel guilty and you end up torn between the two. There's nothing like being torn between two job offers and you don't know which one to take and you don't want to make a mistake and you don't want to regret your decision and you wrestle around trying to decide, should I take it or not? Torn between two houses is a very difficult. Anytime you're torn between two different things, it is a very difficult, uncomfortable place to be in. Torn between two churches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go over here because it's my tradition. I go over here because I get blessed. And you're torn between two churches. Emotionally distraught, to some degree traumatized, sometimes feeling fraudulent in both places. Have you ever showed up as an imposter because you were torn between the two? Jesus talks to the Pharisees in parables because he wants them to understand that what he has to offer is a new thing. And anytime God gets ready to offer you a new thing, not everybody has the elasticity to embrace the progression of that which is new at the expense of giving up that which is old. We cleave to that which is old because it's familiar. We cleave to that which is old because it's traditional. We cleave to that which is old because in certain circles it is acceptable. The vulnerability of letting go of something old to embrace something new is a frightening experience. You don't know what to expect. You don't know if it will be there for you. You don't know if you can really count on it. You don't know if it's really real. And so many, many times you will have one hand on yesterday and one hand on today and you are torn between the two. In our text, Jesus is wrestling with the Pharisees. In the time of Jesus Christ, it was an era of what is called the second temple. And according to Josephus, the historian, there were roughly about 6,000 
Pharisees living during that time. And the Pharisees had both religious power and political influence. They were intimidating. They were used to being honored and respected, revered, and often they were able to show themselves to be so pious because the term Pharisee literally means to be set apart. And they prided themselves on how different they were. And when Jesus came along and threatened their orthodoxy with something new, they attacked him on every turn. Because some people pray for better, but when better comes, they don't accept better because worse is familiar. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. I hope you wore some hard toed shoes because I'm, I'm gonna step on some toes tonight. Worse is familiar. What makes you stay with somebody that's abusing you and beating you and, and slapping you and leaving you with a black eye and you could get away? They're gone at work all day, but you still stay sometimes because worse is familiar. An abusive companion, an abusive boyfriend, an abusive church, an abusive job. Sometimes we are loyal to a fault. Have you ever been loyal? to a fault. All the loyal people say amen. amen. Yeah, it takes something for you to break away even when you know you should break away because you are loyal to a fault. The Pharisees were loyal to a tradition and an ideology that was supposed to be expectant of a Messiah, and yet when the Messiah comes, that which they expected, they rejected because they were loyal to orthodoxy, because when you are orthodox, you are accepted. The word orthodox is to, be, is to fit in with that which is acceptable. And any time you fall in love with fitting in, it becomes an idol in your life. Where the opinions of other people become more powerful to you than the Word of God itself. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. He is the Word incarnate. He is the Word made physical. He is the Word made tangible. He is God revealed in human form. He is that which the Pharisees had studied all of their lives. They were noted for being scholars and theologians and, and studying the Word of God. And here they are standing in front of the Word they studied and won't accept the Word that they studied because He has come in the flesh. The oxymoron is staggering that the religious people actually gave Jesus more trouble than the sinners. The sinners always embraced him. It was the church people that gave him hell. Oh, did I say that in church? Yeah, I think I already said it out loud, so I might as well stick with it since I put it out. It was the church people that called him wine bibber. It was the church people that called him Beelzebub. It was the church people that challenged his theology. It was the church people that attacked him. It was the church people because he came with new theology that threatened their orthodoxy, and if they gave up their orthodoxy, who would they be? Sometimes being somebody important to people becomes more important than being somebody obedient to God. The idolatry of it all is staggering, and Jesus speaks to them in parables because playing out truth did not seem to get through to them. He called them a generation of hypocrites and vipers, and they wouldn't accept that. So he started talking to them in parables in the hope that maybe they would see themselves in the text, that they would understand that they were all fabric, <laughs> that they had lost the ability to stretch, to grow, to evolve, to move forward, to become. They were worn and withered and weary and stayed and stubborn and absolute. And Christ had come to do a new thing. 
but one cannot take new fabric and sew it to old fabric without there being a tear. And some of us are so afraid of a tear that we won't accept anything new. because it might make the old uncomfortable. And if whoever told you that God won't make you uncomfortable didn't know God, because the God I know is disruptive. The God I know will make you uncomfortable. The God I know will wake you up at two o'clock in the morning. The God I know will have you pacing the floor. The God I know will challenge your ideas. The God I know will call you out on the carpet. The God I know will confront you. The God I know will reveal you and make you see yourself. I am sick of prophets that can see everybody but themselves. If you got that kind of revelation, how come you don't see you? I see, I say, I see, I say, I see, see yourself. See yourself. See yourself. Get a revelation on yourself. Hallelujah to God. And the older I get, the quicker I am to tell you. Don't run up on me because I'll embarrass you because I'm not going to play along with your games. I'm not going to be slain if I'm not slain. I'm not going to fall out if I'm not falling out. I'm not going to give consent to something I don't agree with. I don't agree with it. And the Bible said that old fabric and new fabric did not agree. Sometimes you got to be bold enough to disagree. The problem today, we have too many coward Christians. You're coward. You want to get along with the culture. You want to be accepted by your friends. You want to be accepted by your peers. And you're not willing to stand out and be scandalized and ostracized. And yet you say, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. Do you really trust him? Do you trust him when people are talking about you? Do you trust him when people are scandalizing you? Do you trust him when you're dealing with uncertainty? Do you trust him when you have to be vulnerable? Do you trust him when you have to be transparent? Or are you a little bit new and a little bit old? And the trauma you deal with every day is that you are torn between the two. The, the you you are at work and the you you are at church. The you you are when you're with your boys and the you you are when you come in the sanctuary. There ought not to be two different yous. Hallelujah. The reason you don't have any peace is because there's too many of you standing in the same pair of shoes. One of the definitions of the word peace is to be at one again, to be one within yourself. The Bible said if the eye is single, the whole body is full of light. You can't get revelation until you get single. You talking about getting married and you ain't single yet. Oh, mess with me, I dare you, I'll fight you in here. You're not single. How can you get married when you're not single? You're still fragmented. You're still three quarters. You're still five sixteen. You gotta find wholeness. It's what the Bible calls singleness of heart. Singleness of heart brings peace. But it is not easy to have singleness of heart because there's always something pulling at you, drawing you, a gravitational pull to go backwards rather than forwards. I often say it, but it makes it no less true. You don't have to struggle to fall. All you have to do is let go. 
But if you're going to climb a tree, it's going to take some effort and some energy. When you get ready to fall, you don't need any energy, just let go. If you let go, you're going to fall. But if you hold on, you're going to go higher. But expect to sweat if you're going to go up. You're not going to go up just because you want up. You're going to have to put some work in it, some sweat in it, and grind. But all you have to do to fall is let go. And some of us are torn. Should I hold on or should I let go? Should I endure or should I let go? Should I fight for it or should I just give in? And we dress it up with religious statement. If the Lord wants me to have it, if the Lord meant for me to be there, he would open up. You blame God because you're lazy. Oh, I don't, I don't mean to make you mad tonight. You blame God for your laziness. You don't understand that there are some things that you have to put some work in it. Sometimes you have to stretch forth your rod. Some times you have to stretch forth a withered hand. Sometimes you have to give your two fish and five loaves of bread. And you're praying to feed the 5,000, but you're holding on to your lunch and you're torn between the two. How can you say the scriptures don't work when you don't work them? Look at somebody and tell them it'll work if you work it. Yeah, it'll work if you work it. Every promise of God, it'll work if you work it. I've given you the land to possess it, but you still got to work it. Hallelujah, I'll give you houses that you didn't build, but you still got to move into it. It'll work if you work it. It don't work if you don't work it. Till you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, consistent. 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 Consistency. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You have to understand this, that if you're diligent, diligency will get you there. Oh yeah, you gotta be diligent, you gotta go after it, it'll get you there. But consistency will keep you there. <laughs> and gratitude will give you more of what's there. So you have to be diligent to get there. You have to be consistent to stay there. And you have to be grateful to get everything out of being there. Some people get there, but they're not grateful. They get there and they got a bad attitude. They, grit, they get there and they got a bad disposition. But gratitude unlocks the fullness of where you're at. That's why the devil doesn't want you to be grateful. He wants you to be worried. He wants you to be worried. He can't stop you from being in a blessed place, but he wants you to be worried. So you're torn between being blessed and being worried. Oh, I'm going I'm to get with you tonight. And you are torn between the two. Jesus, as he furthers his dialogue, moves it away from fabric because obviously they do not respond to the fabric. And he starts to talk about wine. And he says, no man puts new wine in old skins. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what new wine could be. New wine often in the scriptures represents the Holy Spirit. These men are not drunk as you are supposed, seeing as it is, but the third hour of the day, he didn't say they weren't drunk, but he said we're not drunken as you suppose, seeing as it is, but the third hour of the day. But this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So sometimes when you talk about wine, it is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. But if the wine here is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, that means that if God put new wine, the Holy Spirit, into old skins, my body, then my body would burst. And every filled person with the Holy Ghost in the room know you got filled and didn't burst. <laughs> 
So when we look at the text new wine, we are understanding it to be, I believe, to be new revelation. But if you put new revelation into old systems of tradition, you will burst. One of the churches I grew up in, I got put out of. Only time I ever got put out of a church. I got put out of the church because we had gone to sing over at a little sanctified church and got filled with the Holy Ghost. And we came back, we were trying to be cool about being filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and Brother Womack started speaking in tongues and my hands flew up off the keyboard and then the one other girl got slain in the spirit and the deacons had a meeting after the church said, you're no longer welcome here. Why, why are you not welcome? Because you're trying to put new wine. <laughs> you're trying to put new wine in old skins and I had to make a decision. Do I love the skins? <laughs> or do I love the wine? Somebody tonight needs to make a decision. Do you love the old skins more than you love the new wine? I chose the new wine. So I walked away from a beautiful church to go to a raggedy church where the roof was leaking because it wasn't a building that saved me. Come on, talk to me, somebody. See, once you get a touch of the new wine, it wasn't a problem for me to let go of the old skins. So don't back me in a corner and make me have to choose because I might not choose you. Don't ask me a question you don't want an answer to. It's better to leave me alone because if you back me in a corner, I'm probably not going to choose old skins when I have a chance at new wine. Now, the problem with new wine and old skins is that new wine is a moving thing. In the process of fermentation, it emits gases, and the gases begin to stretch the skins. And the problem with new wine is that it cannot help but be transformative because it is evolving. And any time it is evolving, it has to be with something that has the elasticity to be flexible. And the problem with old skins is that old skins have lost the pliability to be able to move with the new wine. So when the thing in you is moving and the thing outside of you is not moving, something's got to break. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? It, it forces a disruption when you get new revelation and new word and new insight and new power from God. It will threaten what you are accustomed to because it's lost the elasticity to change, to grow, to ebb and flow. Now, there's nothing wrong with old skins because at one time old skins were new skins. Let's think about this text a minute. The sin is not in the skin because at one time the skin was new, but it has lost its elasticity. It is easy with time to lose your elasticity. It is easy when you get older to forget what it was like to be young and criticize young people for something Oh, y'all not going to talk to me much tonight. Y'all not going to talk to me. How could you do that? And just wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Think back, old man. Think back, think back, think back, think back, think back, think back, think back. It's easy for you now to say, how could you do it? Because you're 79. But when you were 19, you wouldn't ask that question. If you're not careful, time will take away elasticity. Jesus is standing on the brink between the old covenant and the new covenant. And he comes to bring, to fulfill the law and to bring the new covenant.
And the problem is, when he starts teaching out of the new, the old has lost its elasticity. It wasn't always wrong. It wasn't wrong on Mount Sinai. It wasn't wrong when they were going through the wilderness. It wasn't wrong when Jesus, when, when God turned bitter water sweet. It wasn't wrong when they crossed the Jordan, but it has lost its pliability. And they are coming to a new covenant. That's why you have a new testament. The word testament is a like last will and testament. So the New Testament is not enforced until the testator dies. So Jesus is in the final hours of the Old Testament and he's talking New Testament truth to Old Testament people. And he came unto his own and his own received him not. And the skins begin to burst. So they scream, crucify him. Because some people, when they are faced with present truth, they'd rather kill the truth and keep the skin. Oh, talk, talk to me. Talk to me. I'm still in this text. They would rather kill the truth. It was easier for them to kill the truth and keep the tradition. It's kind of like Cain and Abel. All Cain had to do was kill a lamb, but instead he found it easier to kill his brother. I'm, I'm kind of scared of people who, who, who won't hurt an animal but to kill you. I'm scared of people who will throw paint on your coat because they're protecting an animal but to shoot you in the head. It's the sin of Cain. Cain found it easier to kill truth and hold on to tradition. And God cursed him because the skins burst. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but whatever you're torn between two, it's time for you to make a decision. Either you're going to walk into the light of what God is saying now give us this day our daily bread, or you're gonna to try to eat old bread with worms in it. See, the reason that the manna got full of worms is that God never intended for his people to eat old bread. He wanted us to depend on him for daily bread because God is not worried about what he used to say we are living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And if you go back and try to eat the manna that fell yesterday, the Bible said it was full of worms because God is not trying to take you back to what he has said. He's trying to take you forward to what he is saying. If he were trying to take you back, then Abram would have killed Isaac. For God said, take now thy son, Genesis 22, thine only son, and offer him up as a burnt offering. That's what God had said. But then what God is saying by the time he gets there is Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Now he is torn between what God has said and what God is saying. If he obeys what God has said, he's gonna kill his son. You all don't hear what I'm saying. Oh, I want to shake you out of your tradition. I want to take you out of your old tradition. I want to shake you out of your old thinking because God is pouring new wine. Can we go deeper in this text? See. Throw your hands up and say, Lord, keep me flexible. Yeah, I want to go with you. I want to grow with you. I want to flow with you. I want to evolve with you. 
I want to move with you. I want to open my heart and open my spirit. I don't want to get stuck on old bread. I don't want to eat wormy stuff. I don't want to stay in the hog pen and eat that which the swine did eat. I'd rather humble myself and go back to my father's house and eat fresh bread than to eat old slop. Somebody's been eating old slop and God wants to do a new thing in your life. And the Lord told me to teach this class because you're torn between the two. Now, the Bible says, neither do men take new wine and pour it into old skins because I explained to you as the wine begins to ferment, it swells and the old skins will burst because the system you're in does not have the elasticity to flow with the revelation God is pouring in you. And I know you're staying saying you're going to change it, but you can't change old skins. <laughs> the Bible said if you pour new wine into old skins, not only will the skins burst, but the wine will waste. So if you try to take something new and pour it into something old, it's not just that you tear what's old, you lose what's new. So this text leaves you bankrupt. <laughs> you neither have the old skins nor the new wine. It is all depleted and spoiled because you tried to force that which is into that which was. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Am I helping anybody tonight? I'm praying that while I'm teaching that the Holy Spirit will speak to you about certain things in your life that you need to make a decision about. Either you're hot or you're cold. Either you're in or you're out. He said, I just don't want you to be lukewarm. I don't want you to be torn between two. I, if you're cold, I can deal with it. If you're hot, I can deal with it. But if you're torn between the two, you make me sick in the stomach. I don't want you to be torn between the two. You don't take new wine and pour it into old skins. And there you are trying to change the skins. And you can't change that which has lost its elasticity. Some people just don't want to change. Some institutions just don't want to change. Some organizations just don't want to change. And they would rather say crucify him than change. They would rather kill you in the field than to change. They would rather destroy your name than to change. And for them, God said, come out from among them and be ye separated. For them, God said, if you speak peace and they don't receive it, leave quickly and shake the dust off your feet. And I will remember them in the day of judgment. Don't try to force them to embrace what they have rejected. <laughs> so in the text here, we are, we are dealing with the first warning comes to avoid the temptation to cleave to antiquated ideologies, old concept, historical ideas, institutionalism, because God is doing a new thing in you. But then the text goes further and says that if you put new wine in new skins, Preserve it. Watch. Don't drink it. Preserve it. It is just as dangerous to use what's new than it is to get stuck in what's old. He says, if you put new wine in new skins, he said, both will be preserved. 
not used. So on one hand, he's talking to us about the danger of using that which is antiquated. And on the other hand, he's warning us about being quick to use something just because it's new. <laughs> and we're living in a time and an age and an era that people are just new to be new. It's just gotta be new. It's just new for the sake of being new. But the Bible said, lay hands suddenly on no man. Commit the work of the gospel into the hands of faithful men. Watch them and see how long they're preserved before you start using them. Because they have to, if they don't stand some tests, if they don't go through some fire, if they can't take a licking and keep on ticking, if you can't rebuke them and them come back, then they are bastards and not sons. But today we are following new just to be new. We're following people who have no message, who have no ministry, who have no unction, who have no authority. I'm not saying that God didn't call them. I'm saying they haven't been preserved. So when the gases come and the changes come, we're drinking something that has not been fully fermented. So instead of drinking wine, you're drinking sour grape juice. So this text is balanced because it is just as dangerous to chase every new thing than it is to hold on to every whole old thing. It says, when you pour new wine, in the new skins, leave it alone and let it expand and move and go through changes before you drink it because it's not ready yet. It's process. You hit it dead on the head, it's process. It's not that there's not a promise there, but it has to go through process. One of the most dangerous things that the church does today, as soon as somebody can sing or can preach or can talk, we're ready to put them up on stage and use them. No, you got to go through process. You're anointed, but sit your little self down. Clap your hands. You don't need no song. You get in the back and sing alto. Real low, sing alto, real low. Until you've been through some stuff, till you withstood some tests, Till you learn how to praise him when your heart was broken. Till you learn how to clap your hands when your rent was past due. Till you learn how to praise him when your body was racked with pain. Till you've been through a test and a trial. You ain't fermented enough for us to drink you. It's just as dangerous to use your too new than it is to get stuck in that which is old. And now people are just being new for the sake of being new. They just go out of their way to be new. Just got to be new. It's got to be new. It's got to be new. And they enter into error and heresy because they make revelation out of everything to the point of heresy. Because whatever you saw on Instagram, you ready to go preach it. You didn't even study the text to see what context it was. You just grabbed a phrase and ran off and tried to preach because you heard somebody say one phrase and a text out of context is heresy. Because you love promise, but you hate process. It takes time to have a great marriage. It takes time to have a great husband. It takes time to be a great mama. It takes time to be a great wife. And so, so if, if he ain't everything today, you want out. If she ain't everything today, you want out. Because you're looking at somebody been married 30 years, and you've been married three months, and you say, how come you're not treating me like you? you you still knew, baby. 
sit on over there in your new skins and swell up. And wait a while. You're not ready yet to drink. Oh, I gotta hear, I gotta hear. Can, 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 am I helping anybody? Throw your hands up and say, I'll wait on you, Lord. If you don't give me the house, I'll wait on you. If you don't give me the job, I'll wait on you. If you don't give me the new car, I'll wait on you. If I have to be single five more years, I'll wait on you. If I have to live by myself, I'll wait on you. If I have to pray all night, I'll wait on you. If I have to call on my knees, I'll wait on you. Don't send me anywhere I'm not ready to go. Don't use me any way you're not ready to use me. Don't take me any place you're not ready to take me. I'd rather sit on the back burner and ferment than go too soon and ruin my destiny. Oh, God. I don't want to get torn between the two. Uh, now, let me show you what, what I'm talking about. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. I have to run through it now. I'm gonna get your Bible. Go to John 3, chapter 1 through 12. And I'm going to show you what I mean. And I want you to take your religious glasses off and read the text like you never heard it. Because if you read it like you heard it, you're going to miss it. Right? Because we're not, we're not going to read it with old skins. We're just going to read it like we never read it. Before. Now, there was a man of Pharisees, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That same came to Jesus by night. He snuck to Jesus by night because he is a ruler of the Pharisees. The very folk Jesus just got through fussing at and said unto him, Rabbi, we know new wine, that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And the moment he told Jesus he had new wine, Jesus told him, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. Because if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom. You cannot have this kind of revelation and go back and play with the Pharisees. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. See, once you see who he is, <laughs> you can't go back into blindness and act like you don't know what you know. So you can give up on being a secret agent for Jesus and coming by night to him. He said, I know you must be born again because you just showed me you got new wine. But where you came from is old skins. And Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time? enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born. We're dealing with skin. We're dealing with skin. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He cannot go in. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Hold it a minute. Ye must be born again. Jesus, wait a minute. He didn't ask you about being born again. He just told you that he knew that no man could do these things save God be with him. And called you rabbi and said, I know that you are the truth. And Jesus says, you must be born again because you cannot hold revelation in old skins. Now Nicodemus is in a dilemma because does he go back to the skins? <laughs> and he is a ruler of the Pharisees. Or does he follow Jesus, which is the wine? 
Jesus says to him, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it come, and whether it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You're looking for physical stuff, I'm talking about spiritual stuff. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Wait, Nicodemus didn't say, yes, Lord, I repent. Yes, Lord, I accept you. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I, I follow you. Yes, Lord, I commit. He said, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Don't you study the word? Don't you know the word when you hear the word? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we know, we do know, we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? So, the thing that, that most scholars wrestle with is yes, Jesus told Nicodemus he must be born again, but was he? <laughs> I ain't gonna bother y'all tonight. Did you read anything in that text? that says Nicodemus was born again? Did Jesus not say, you received not what I gave you? So I'm not judging him. I don't know. All I know is that the scriptures leave some ambiguity as if Nicodemus is torn between the two. He is coming to see Jesus by night, but he's hanging out with the Pharisees by day. And we don't hear anything else about Nicodemus until the crucifixion. We don't see him at the miracles. We don't see him at the Last Supper. We don't see him when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. We don't see him when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. We don't even see him when he's on his way to the cross when blind Bartimaeus cried out, have mercy on me, thou son of David, oh, that I might receive my sight. The only thing we know for sure is that Nicodemus is torn between the two. There is one other place that they mention him, and it is after Jesus is crucified. Can I show you this? John 19, 38 through 42. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first sight came to Jesus by night. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and a, and a hundred pound weight. Then took, they the body, then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices and the manner as the manner of the Jews is to bury him. He buried him, but did he believe him? He gave money 
I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just asking, did he believe it? Now, in, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus. Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And that's the last we hear about Nicodemus. And the question tonight, my brothers and sisters, is simply this. Did Nicodemus spend all of his life torn between the two? Unable to respond. I don't know. The Bible doesn't make it clear. I cannot find any place where he obeyed what Jesus said. He only heard what Jesus said. And I want to know, do you obey what Jesus said, or do you only hear what Jesus said? And if you hear it and don't obey it, then what is your Pharisee? That keeps you torn between the two. Was it love that made him give the hundred shekels or guilt? I cannot find a moment that answers that question. Are you here because you love Jesus? Or do you only come when you're guilty? And the worst part of it is, is that he knew who Jesus was. He said, no man can do these things Save God, be with him. And Jesus says, what you doing with them Pharisees? Who are your Pharisees? Who is it that Jesus would ask, how could you know me like you know me? And still stay with them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you can't know this much about me and not be born again. You can't take this new wine and put it in old skin. You're watching me right now. How can you know what you know and still run with who you run with? has the seduction of being accepted by the Pharisees rivaled the revelation of what you know about Jesus? And are you just torn between the two? So let a man examine himself. Where are your Pharisees? Who would Jesus be shocked to see that you can't separate from to be with him? How long Will you have new wine in old skins?
Because if you really know who Jesus is, verily, verily, I say unto you, he must be born again. No if, no ands, no maybes, no choices. You know too much. You've seen too much. He showed himself too strong in your life for you to go back to the Pharisees and hang out with the Sanhedrins who are persecuting Jesus. I'm always scared of people who come to me and tell me what everybody was saying about me. Because I always want to know, well, what did you say? Be, be, because if they felt comfortable to talk about me in front of you, it makes me wonder, are you torn between the two? And I better be careful what I say back because a dog that'll bring them will, will carry one. Because if you were really with me, they wouldn't be comfortable to talk about me around you because you would identify yourself. But if you are torn between the two, you want to be friends with the Pharisees and slip over to me by night. And you are torn between the two. Now this is a word, and it is what it is. And I'm gonna leave it just like it is. <laughs> I'm not gonna put no whipped cream on it, no cherries, no bananas. I'm gonna leave it right like God left it on you. You're watching online tonight, you're watching for a reason because the Holy Spirit wants you to make a decision. I would that you were either hot or cold, but you ain't neither one. When you're around me, you talk Jesus talk. When you're around them, you're torn between the two. New fabric sold to old, torn. New wine and old skins. New wine, new skins, and served too soon. Have you really made up your mind? Or do you just like to keep company in both places? As I close tonight, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes until you see nobody but yourself. Who are your Pharisees? And have they become idols in your life? Because they made you a, a ruler. <laughs> they make you feel important. And yet there is something wooing you toward Jesus that while the rest of the Pharisees are in bed, you're slipping to him by night because deep down in your heart, you know that he is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, you can walk out of here tonight torn between the two and I can't stop you.
Well, you could stand up on your feet and say, I'm tired of being torn. I want to be whole.